Alrighty, Cherubs, so today we're going to talk about the late Northern Renaissance and how the Reformation impacted uh, art. Okay, so we've got three pieces to discuss today. Uh, two prints and one painting. Now, this story all begins back with St. Peter, and sometimes, you know, art does, in fact, change the world. St. Peter's Basilica, like we talked about in class already, was torn down by Julius II. The original was built by Constantine on the tomb of the side of the tomb of Saint Peter. Um, Constantine builds this church. It lasts for a thousand years. Julius II sees this church. It inherits this church. It is the centerpiece of Christianity. He decides that it is uh, old and in need of repair, and tears it down to build a new structure. Um, Bramante comes up with the original plan. Raphael then takes over when Bramante dies. Uh, various other artists and architects take over in their turn. It's finally left up to Michelangelo to finish the thing. And it is finished, in fact, after Michelangelo's uh, lifetime. Okay, But Michelangelo does build the, the main footprint of the building that we see, as well as the dome on it. Now, the popes famously, during this time, were, mm, especially Leo, Pope Leo X, were not handling the funds, maybe perhaps the way they that should have been handled. And so what happened was they began to sell indulgences. Now, indulgences were a way to pay for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, in essence, what happened was that people were, you would pay for um, an indulgence, which shortened the time of a person's life, or afterlife, rather, in purgatory. So it, the belief was that a person had to spend time in purgatory to be purged of their sins before they were worthy to enter the heavenly realm, to enter the presence of God. Um, if you purchased indulgences for yourself and for your ancestors, then that time in purgatory would become lessened and you could get uh, into heaven faster. And so essentially it was a money-making scheme to pay for St. Peter's Basilica. Okay, Here are a couple videos, and I'll link these in the description above as well as below to so that you can uh, get a a more complete picture of the building and the history of St. Peter's Basilica. It's a fascinating story. And, okay. So the the couplet went around, a coin, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from tur purgatory springs, that when the more that you pay money for indulgences, the more, um, you know, more souls get out of purgatory and more souls go to heaven. Uh, this obviously be, was seen as, for what it was, a money-making scheme and as morally bankrupt, which famously led to the Reformation with Martin Luther. Okay, so Martin Luther's going to come along and say, this is corrupt. He's going to nail his 95 theses to the, to the church in Wittenberg, Germany, he is a believing monk who believes that the Catholic Church can be reformed. Uh, his and he lays out ninety-five arguments of things that do need to change immediately within the Catholic Church. Um, his requests are rejected, and he becomes uh, labeled as a heretic and excommunicated from the Church. His movement, the movement, the people that believe him and they become the Protestants, okay, art is going to change with them. And so the Reformation, they're going to see art as a different, having a different function than it does in the Catholic Church. And so we're going to start to see some of what that looks like today. Now, sometimes science changes art, and we have the invention of the printing press. And this is one of those watershed moments that changes and breaks art with a capital A forever. What the printing press allows to happen is mass art. Okay, It allows for, the in the West, a new medium. It's called printmaking to happen. And we saw some of that in Japan um, already. But this is going to begin this new 
market create art that people can purchase um, fairly cheaply. It's also going to allow for people to buy books a lot cheaper and to spread ideas in pamphlets and, and thoughts a lot faster and a lot cheaper than ever before. So Martin Luther wasn't the first person to um, the first person who got kicked out of the church to um, write books, but he was the first that had the advantage of the printing press. And these cannot be overstated the role that the printing press plays in the spread of the Reformation and its effect on art. Okay, so we had these guys, we had Gutenberg, who <laughs> up here in the north at this time, we had Gutenberg, who invents the printing press, we've got Jan van Eyck, who invents oil paint, and then we've got Martin Luther, who tries to reform the Catholic Church and immense Protestantism. And so we have these monumental shifts happening up here in the north, and that's all going to impact history as well as the art. Now we have our first artist to look at is Albrecht Dürer. He is a German artist that a master of his craft he is a painter, and he dives headlong into the new technology, the new medium of printmaking. Okay, he is a careful, careful draftsman, and he's coming from the school of this Northern Renaissance style, where you can see where every blade of grass, every whisker on the rabbit, everything is so minutely detailed. Because again, in the North, detail and a multiplicity of symbols, as well as a multiplicity of details, is more uh, important than mathematical accuracy. Okay, and that's still going to continue. But you can see, I mean, you can tell genus and species of plants in this. I mean, it, he's a master of his craft. He is going to create uh, wood blocks, wood block prints. Okay, so the one on the left is for an example of one of those prints. And you can see that it is done in 1498 in this very kind of Gothic style. He does travel to Italy, and this is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. He does travel to Italy, and after he travels to Italy, this is what he creates. It's Death, the Night, Death, and the Devil is the title of this piece. But you can see how the difference, how he's grown as an artist, and how this is much more uh, grounded in mathematical precision, as well as the accurate anatomy, as well as the chiaroscuro, the sfumato, the techniques that um, are popular down in Italy at the time. So he's going to transfer what he knows of when he learns in Italy up to the north and, and make that shift. Now this is also, this is a woodblock print on the left. On the right, this is an etching. So this is going to be done in metal. Okay, so you're going to be able to get much more subtle shifts of value, much finer, finer lines here. And that's why he's able to make this look more photorealistic. Okay, so here in Germany, after um, he travels to Italy, he's going to produce this piece. Now, this is a little bit earlier than the uh, Night, Death, and the Devil that we just saw. This is Adam and Eve. You can see here in this picture, Adam and Eve are um, standing at the Tree of Knowledge. But the Tree of Knowledge, and here in the Garden of Eden, it looks very much like a German forest, a dense, you know, German forest that is is full and dark and kind of Grimm's fairy tale-ish. This is the, the Black Forest of Germany. This is what they look like. They're very, very, very dense. Okay, so he depicts Eden as Germany. And here we see the Tree of Life with the fruit, and Adam and Eve are picking, Eve is picking the fruit. She's being handed the fruit by the serpent here, and you can see that it is chuck full then of other animals. Out here in the distance, you can see this goat, this mountain goat perched on this um, ledge. You can see the other animals here, the cow, the um, rabbit, the cat. Uh, under, I'll move my cursor here, so you can see it under Adam's right foot, there is a mouse. He's stepping on this mouse's tail, okay? And then there's this parrot up in this, this, um, branch that Adam is holding with a little sign that has Albrecht Durer's name on it. All right. 
you can see again they're covered by their the fig leaves now this is very this is an important etching this is an important work this engraving here where again it's carved into metal you coat we'll see this video here in just a second on how engraving is done okay but you can see that they are going to be Albrecht Durer is going to be using classic statues, the Apollo Belvedere and the Venus de Medici, um, for the models for this picture. That he's so influenced by um, classical Roman statues, by the ideas of the Italian Renaissance to create this piece. That the focus is on the beauty of the human form, as well as capturing the light and the shadow in that on those forms. Okay. The beauty of printmaking is that it is available for mass production. So many, many, many people were able to participate in the consumption of this work rather than having to go to one church to see it. Many people were able to see this piece because it is a print. Okay. Now, again, everything being it a northern work, there's a multiplicity of meanings. The animals all mean something. The sleeping cat and the rat that or the mouse that is uh, running away, the bunny, the, the parrot, the goat, the ox. They all have meanings, just like all northern pieces. Okay, so I'm going to link these two uh, videos above. This is how to do an etching, all right, as well as uh, some more information on Albrecht Durer and at his engraving the Adam and Eve. Okay. Now this next piece is another um, print, but it's again, it's a woodblock print. So this is carving into wood to make this print. So you're going to get much less fine details here. And I'm going to click on this guy so you can see it just a little bit better. There's a lot happening here in this piece. This is called The Allegory of Law and Grace by Lucas Cranach. Okay, Cranach was personal friends with Martin Luther. And there's a lot happening here. And so you can see um, it's divided into two. Okay, and we're getting a lot less value shifts. It's a lot less photo real, a lot less quote, naturalistic than, um, for example, the Adam and Eve is. And that's because this is a woodblock print. And so your lines are going to, by nature, they just have to be thicker. Okay, we're going to, there's going to be a clip that you can watch later on how to produce that woodblock print and to see what that process looks like. Now, again, it's divided into two parts and it's divided by the tree of knowledge. And on the left, you're getting this scene. You can see here, there's lots of things happening. There are fire, people roasting in the fire. There are death and demons are driving this person into the fire. There's Moses over here holding the tablets of the law, as well as other figures. You've got Adam and Eve in the background at the Tree of Knowledge. And you've got Christ and Mary and John the Baptist up in heaven. On the other side, you've got Christ on the cross with a lamb. You've got Mary. <laughs> you've got the shepherds. You've got a person who is getting sprayed by the blood of Jesus, and it's being transmitted to him by this dove here. There's a figure pointing up at Christ, and then Christ leaving the tomb. So let's break all this down. This is the story of law and grace, all right, law and the gospel. What it's doing is, on one hand, it's comparing the Old and the New Testaments, okay? And there are many different versions of this piece. There are painted versions. BYU, for a time, had a copy of a painted version of this, and they're all coming from the school of Lucas Cranach. Now, it's again, it's comparing and contrasting the Old and the New Testaments, um, as well as the dedication to ritual in 
Protestant Christianity, the idea is that you're more focused on faith, that the grace of Jesus Christ will save you, that because of Christ's sacrifice, humanity will find salvation through that act alone, and that all that you need to do is then believe that in his, uh, to access his uh, um, atonement. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, is saying, no, you, well, that, that's true, but you also need to have um, ordinances and you have to go through ceremonies that are required to make these things efficacious in your life. So the Protestants are going to look at the, the Catholic Church as being very old and dogmatic and requiring this list of rules that priests stand in between you. You have to, A priest mediates between you and God, whereas in the Protestant brand of Christianity, you have direct access to God and Christ. Okay, so they're going to unfavorably compare uh, Catholic Christianity and to the Old Testament and to being strict adherence to rules and checklists as opposed to their brand of Christianity, which is going to be more much more favorable. So on the left, then, you have God, Christ, sitting on the throne of heaven, and lilies are bursting from his ear so that you can see that, again, he will be resurrected um, later. Uh, he has a sword. I'm not sure, <laughs> frankly, why there is a sword also coming out of his other ear. I'm not sure what that represents. I'll have to look that up. But the inclusion of Adam and Eve here show you, again, the how the Old Testament, they are, are people are sinful by their very nature, that by the fact that people were born, people were born sinners. Okay, and that's a very Catholic idea that you need to be saved from original sin. And Protestantism is going to say, nah, not so much. So that's why Adam and Eve are included over here to remind you that if you're a Catholic, you're guilty of original sin. All right, then you have Moses, and Moses is going to be the figure as a in he's in the same position as Christ as the main figure to say like, aha, here are the here is the strict rules that you must obey and you have if you don't obey all the rules then you're going to go to hell and this is what's happening here that death and sin sin and death are here driving all of humanity into the fires of hell that because they have they're cut off from the grace of god because of the endless rules that they are forced to checklist whereas on this side it's telling us the story of the new testament where uh, god is gracious in the old testament god is very um again has his lists but in the new testament god is gracious so that's why they're telling us the story of the new testament here where for example um the shepherds are hearing the angels tell them the good news that Christ is born. You're having Mary receive the Annunciation. And we see the little the little cherub the little flying in with the cross. That's, again, the Holy Spirit about to overlay Mary, the Spirit of Christ, about to overlay Mary and make her pregnant. Okay? So we get the Annunciation. We get the Nativity with the shepherds. We get the figure here that's being bathed in the blood of Christ. Um and washed clean of his sins. And then, of course, you get Christ, who is beating sin and death, who has conquered sin and death through his resurrection and his sacrifice on the cross. Now, this last picture over here, this last thing, is actually a scene from the Old Testament, where there was a moment when the children of Israel who were fleeing Egypt were going to... Um, were being attacked by these snakes. And so God tells Moses they were being bitten by the thousands and dying from these snake bites. Or so God tells Moses, what you need to do is make this brass snake and put it on a pole and the people will, if they look at it, they'll be healed. So they see this as an allegory for the grace of Christ, that they're not required to do anything at all but look. Whereas, you know, over here, <laughs> they would be required to go through rituals and checklists. Whereas over here, you are just look, just have faith, and you will be saved. 
Okay, so this is the Allegory of Law and Grace by Lucas Cranach, the Elder. Again, personal friend of Martin Luther, who, was, who may have asked him directly to create this piece. Now, I will link this video here for you. It's, again, how to pr create a woodblock print. Um, and that's the story of the Allegory of Law and Grace. Our last piece are coming from the North Countries of uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, Flanders and the Netherlands. Okay, and we're getting the hunters in the snow. And this is this piece is in here because it helps to show that while the last two we saw were religious in nature, we're going to see up north now a shift away from religious pieces. That secular art is going to become increasingly important up north. Down in Italy, in France, in the Catholic, in the countries that remain Catholic. Religious art is going to stay, um, be the most important thing. Up north, because of that Protestant Reformation shift, you're going to see a lot less religious art, especially down through the years, to the degree that um, it's going to influence the world that we see today. So what this is, is The Hunters in the Snow by Peter Bruegel the Elder. 1565 oil on wood and I'm going to zoom in here so you can get a better look at this piece so this was a picture of from a series of pictures that depict the the seasons and the months of the year and that show you kind of what's happening during those times and you're seeing just various things things that happen here in the winter months, hunters in the snow. You can see that here are the hunters in the snow and they're coming back from their um, hunt. You can see the dog's heads are down and all but the little puppy, they all have their little tails down in between their legs and they're not happy because they did not catch anything. And you can see that they have, they're bringing back nothing from their unsuccessful hunt. Their heads are down. Okay, it's painted in somber colors. You can't see their faces because they're shadowed. They're turned away from us as they trudge through the snow. So they did not have a successful hunt. Okay, meanwhile, you're getting people at the local shop here that are, um, whose sign has come, the one hook has come undone, all right, uh, building a fire out front. And they are, they are cold, they are cold. It is a this cold Netherlandish um, winter. People pulling their carts. But then as you see off into the distance, you see people, they are curling, they're playing games. Other people these other people here in the distance are unaware of the plight of the hunters. Okay? That you see these um, people playing ice hockey and children chasing each other. Uh, on the ice and the dog out in the ice there so they're curling they're playing games here out on the ice they're ice skating P other people are going about their chores this woman is pulling this girl on this sled okay the icicles hanging off so we see again this replica of oh, this whole little village people all the way out in the distance Okay, with the mountains all the way out there, and the endless multiplicity of details. And so this feels very much like, um, for example, Fan Quan's Travelers Among Mountains, right? Where you see the, the, the tininess of, of humanity, even though you see the figures in the foreground are much larger, that you see the small scale of humans as opposed to the um, large scale size of nature. Um, you see the birds up here in the <laughs> up here in the trees kind of mocking the hunters as well as this pheasant taking flight out here in the distance. okay So that's what this piece is about. It's it's a showing of kind of life in the winter months, November, December, as well as, um, kind of showing the plight and the pleasures of during those that time of the year. Again, the endless multiplicity of details and meanings, as well as also showing that northern tradition of of using details and symbols, as well as showing a trend towards secular art.
Okay, and I will link this video up above so you can get uh, some more details about this piece. And those are our pieces for today for the Northern Renaissance. I hope you enjoyed this trip, and we'll see you next time with the Italian Baroque.